We now come to the second part of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, titled A Game of Chess. And you'll remember from the first section, The Burial of the Dead, the primary fear and situation of those in the modern world who are caught in this barren wasteland is the burial of the dead without the prospect of rebirth. That if religious truth and spiritual truth no longer suffices, no longer satisfies us, and we are simply existing in a, a wheel of time that is perpetual and never-ending, yet never without any real growth, uh, then when we die, there perhaps is no prospect of rebirth or meaning beyond. And now we move on to the second section of The Wasteland, A Game of Chess, where the subject matter changes dramatically. That In A Game of Chess, we see... Um, two different stories taking place, uh, both of which involve a married couple. Uh, the first section, the first narrative, describes a wealthier, upper-class couple who are caught in a bad, dull, fading relationship. And then the last narrative is a lower-class, poverty-stricken relationship that is also dreadful and stuck and paralyzed in this modern way, but both of those relationships are introduced by this very general image that Eliot incorporates that relies on several different references and allusions to mythology and to previous classical works. Before we get into the section proper, I mentioned in an earlier segment that each of these five sections of the wasteland uh, tend to incorporate a dimension or essential element, uh, the way that they were previously understood, with earth, fire, water, air, and then the fifth element of spirit. So the burial of the dead concerned earth. In a game of chess, we have the notion of air being employed, primarily because of this image that he uses with the game of chess itself. The chess is a cunning game, is a very cerebral, cerebral game that involves a great deal of strategy, scheming. It is an intellectual match. Which is an interesting choice for Eliot because what the symbol becomes is an agent of communication for the husband and the wife that plays the game of chess about halfway through the section. The chess becomes the symbol of the diminishment their communication has undergone. That this is the only way they can connect now over a game of chess. That the matters of the heart and of the soul, any kind of romance or true love has diminished. It has been reduced to simply a game of chess where one opponent seeks to outmatch and outwit the other, that they are strictly intellectually sparring, they are strategizing, seeking to outdo one another, rather than achieve any real sense of communion, communion or intimacy as husband and wife. All they have is this cold, calculating game of chess. And chess is a cerebral game, it is played from an aerial view that to conquer your opponent in chess, you must have a higher perspective. You must be able to see the pieces of the board. Which again brings uh, those playing the game away from the, the real world, common, plain equality of a marriage into a one-upsmanship where whoever has the higher ground wins the marriage or wins the game of chess. But we get into this first section where we have just a description of this queen, this woman who sits in her chair like a burnished throne. And this opening line is from a play by Shakespeare entitled Antony and Cleopatra. So perhaps Queen Cleopatra is the figure being referenced in this opening section. The chair she sat in like a burnished throne, glowed on the marble. And so we have the sense of Queen Cleopatra, the way she's described in the play as being in her barge on the Nile, surrounded by all of her 
majesty and ornate decoration and beauty, all of the wealth of Egypt at her fingertips. And so she is the quintessential powerful woman, the independent queen who outmatches and outwits not only her subjects, but also her husband, that she is cold, independent, isolated, and powerful. But there's a deeper resonance there, too, with just the nature of the queen piece itself, bringing back the image of chess. In the game of chess, the queen is the most powerful piece. Which seems to be an image that Eliot uses as we get into this section, that we have a marriage being subverted by the wife, but ultimately because there's no real community between husband and wife any longer, that she seeks to dominate as a way of gaining power, rather than uh, become one with her husband, that she seeks control over this game of chess, this symbol for their lack of real community between one another. But there's also an, another interesting piece with the king. Throughout the wasteland, Eliot alludes often to this myth of the Fisher King. The Fisher King has to do with Arthurian legend, the King Arthur tales. Uh, but the essential to collapse that entire myth into a, a brief spot, the the idea of the Fisher King is that once he suffers a wound in battle, uh, the land that he governs suffers a wound, and particularly a wound to the generative organ, that the Fisher King suffers a wound that prohibits him from reproducing, and so he becomes barren and sterile, and as a result, his kingdom fails. And the essential point with the Fisher King myth, as it's used in Eliot, in one of the many ways it's used, is that if the king is lost, the kingdom is lost. Now, as we saw in the burial of the dead, that has a spiritual element to it, that if there is no king, spiritually, how can there be a kingdom? How can there be order to all this chaos around us? How can there be law? How can there be anything to govern our lives if the source of that truth is absent all along? If there's no king, there cannot be a kingdom. And if the king is wounded, the kingdom is wounded, and how that applies to chess, that though the queen is the most powerful piece, the king is the only piece with intrinsic value. If the king is lost, the game is lost, which alludes to this myth. In a land with no king, there cannot be government, meaning, law, order, anything that would allow us to survive. Civilization is lost, which was Eliot's perspective of the modern world that we were the lost generation. We had gone off the rails of all those generations that had gone before. We were kingless. And so what's left then for the queen to take over the board? But we get to this description. The chair she sat in like a burnished throne glowed on the marble where the glass held up by standards wrought with fruited vines from which a golden cupidon peeped out. Another hid his eyes. It's interesting that one can see and one is blind. That essential inequality of the pair that we'll see throughout the section. That it is not a real camaraderie, it is not a real connection if only one of the members is able to see. But the glass doubles the flames. This is an interesting note. The glass, the marble on which the chair, the throne is seated, doubles the flames of seven-branched candelabra reflecting light upon the table. It's interesting that the light that is so luminous and brilliant in this setting is simply reflected light. An artificial, deceptive sort of light. And Eliot emphasizes this even further when he says the glitter of her jewels rose to meet it. So there is certainly doubling going on. All of the light that is filtering through the colored glass and the marble that is creating this brilliant scene for the queen piece is all reflected light, not genuine light. There is no sun to give off any real, absolute light. It's all reflected, all artificial. 
The glitter of her jewels meets with the reflected light of the candelabra, creating a smoke and mirrors effect. There's no real fire. It's all reflected. From satin cases poured in rich profusion in vials of ivory and color colored glass, this is certainly the language for Cleopatra, the queen who is in power. And she is certainly wealthy and noble. Unstoppered lurked her strange synthetic perfumes. Unguent, powdered, or liquid, troubled, confused, and drowned the sense in odors. Here's another sense of that domination. This is the game of chess, and she is winning. Her strange synthetic perfumes, again, the artificial is emphasized there. Her perfumes trouble, confuse, and drown the scents. Now this is interesting looking back and going forward. This idea of drowning came up in the burial of the dead. The cards that Madame Sesostris predicted for us, one of them was to fear death by water, to fear drowning. And again in section 4 of the Wasteland we'll have that exact title, but here we have the drowning of the senses descending into chaos, loss of knowledge, power, all of it is fading under this fog of synthetic perfume, which is interesting as well to consider the, the fog of mustard gas that Eliot uses, particularly in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, this yellow fog that hovers and drowns the senses. Here he's describing that as a woman's perfume drowns after it has troubled and confused. Stirred by the air that freshened from the window, these ascended and fattening the prolonged candle flames, flung their smoke into the lacqueria, stirring the pattern of the coffered ceiling. Huge sea wood fed with copper, burned green and orange, framed by the colored stone in which sad light a carved dolphin swam. Now this is quite a hurdle of descriptions that Eliot is including here, that not only are the strange synthetic perfumes overwhelming the senses, but Eliot himself, the speaker that he's crafted for this section, is overwhelmingly, abundantly providing intense description of the scenery and the queen's sovereignty over it. And here we switch to an interesting reference from Ovid, his Metamorphoses. The speaker says, Above the antique mantle was displayed, as though a window gave upon the sylvan scene, the change of Philomel by the barbarous king so rudely forced. And this is an interesting story from Ovid that we probably need some context from in order to clarify why Eliot is using this image of a woman. There seems to be a contrast going on. That the earlier descriptions for the queen piece, uh, the powerful, domineering woman, is contrasted here with that of the abused, subjected, oppressed woman in Philomel. That in the story in Metamorphoses, Philomel is the sister-in-law to King Tereus and ends up being raped by him. That King Tereus rapes Philomela. which is a story that Eliot will bring back again in section 3, the fire sermon. So the barbarous king, Antarius, rudely forces this change onto Philomela. And the change is, once King Tereus rapes Philomela, he subsequently cuts off her tongue and her hands to prevent her from telling her story. Which again, for Eliot, one of his main one of his main concerns is the Ill inability to tell one story, the inability to provide meaning and narrative in this chaotic world that we live in. The multiplicity of voices tumbling on top of each other prohibits any singular narrative. We'll have the same thing at the end of this section with the interrupting bartender's voice. That it's hard to tell your story when there are obstacles all along the way. Your attempts are stymied at every turn. 
But this change that Eliot's referring to is a change by the gods where Philomela is transformed into a nightingale. And it's in this form of a nightingale that Philomela is able to tell her story in the form of the bird's song. So here, the change is so rudely forced by the barbarous king, yet there the nightingale filled all the desert, there's our wasteland image, with inviolable voice, a voice that is inviolable. And still she cried, and still the world pursues. So here she is still longing to tell the story that the king had prevented her from telling in this domineering game of chess where love has been downgraded to rape and violence and abuse and degradation. And now she is singing her beautiful nightingale song filling the desert. No one has ears to hear. Everyone is hiding in shadow. Yet still she cries and still the world pursues jug jug to dirty ears. This jug jug as uh, we'll see in the fire sermon is likely a reference to a crude reference for sex, that the nightingale's song is simply a repetitive monosyllabic phrasing, jug, 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 something repeated over and over, and it's only dirty hears that hear. So her crying, her nightingale song, in the wasteland, in the desert in which she sings it, is ultimately meaningless. And other withered stumps of time, perhaps a reference to her arms as they are after Tereus has removed her hands, were told upon the walls. All these stories were told on the walls. Staring forms leaned out, leaning, hushing the room and closed. Footsteps shuffled on the stair, under the firelight, under the brush. Her hair spread out in fiery points, glowed into words, then would be savagely still. So we have... Um, a book-ended phrase here with glowing on the marble and glowing into words. The woman is shining brilliantly, both Philomela and the Queen Piece. Yet it ends on this note of savage stillness. Which again, going into the two narratives that we'll have, both the upper class narrative and the lower class narrative, these two contrasting perspectives, stillness itself in marriage can be savage. Surely, a loss of communion, a loss of friendship, the inability to talk, uh, that can be a savage death blow to the unity that once was a marriage. So here's where we get into the first story. We have quotation marks there. The woman is speaking to her husband. She says, my nerves are bad tonight. I'm on edge, tense, conflicted. Already we get a sense of peacelessness. There is no real security. My nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. What are you thinking of? What thinking? What? I never know what you're thinking. Think. Notice the aggression of this opening voice. That this woman is pestering her husband without really giving him an opportunity to respond, that she is relentless. Her nerves are bad. Stay with me, pleading with him to stay, pleading with him to talk, questioning on why he cannot speak, and the imperatives over again. Speak. Think. I never know what you're thinking. This is certainly an observer's look into a relationship that has, has crumbled. It has faded from what it once possibly could be. There is no real prospect for understanding between the two. They are not on the same page. He does not respond. We do not have his quotation in return. He basically relays his thoughts for the reader. And she says, what are you thinking? And he says, I think we are in Rat's Alley where the dead men lost their bones. And this is an image that Elliot will bring again, the alley filled with rats who, as they crawl along the modern 
empty streets of London only have dry, dead bones to scurry across. And he says, that's where I think we are. We are in Rat's Alley. Cold, dark, alone, in the land of the dead. Possibly even a reference to Ezekiel, the valley of dry bones that God brings Ezekiel to, to have him preach to the bones. In the burial of the dead, we saw reference to Ezekiel, the son of man. What are the roots that clutch? In this rat's alley, in this wasteland, what are the roots that clutch? Here the husband says, I think we are in this, this alley, surrounded by dry bones. She responds, what is that noise? He does not answer. He simply thinks the wind under the door. What is that noise now? What is the wind doing? Nothing. Again, nothing. And this concept of nothingness is a real fear. The fear of oblivion, loss of meaning. Described as nothing but a wind under the door. There is nothing at the door. There is nothing coming to save them from their marriage. An image that will ultimately come by the end of this section as they play the game of chess together. She says, do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? The repetition of nothingness, almost as a motif, this under underlying current to their entire conversation is grounded on nothingness. They do not have a firm foundation on which they can operate. He knows nothing, sees nothing, remembers nothing, according to his wife's nagging. He thinks to himself, I remember, those are pearls that were his eyes. Now again, this is a reference to The Tempest, played by Shakespeare that was referenced in section one, The Burial of the Dead. And it's an image of rebirth that the drowned sailor goes to the bottom of the sea, and in his death, his body is transformed into something more luminous, more beautiful, more lovely. And Eliot had already used this image in The Burial of the Dead to describe the impossibility of rebirth. And yet here we have that again, that all this man remembers is a time when there was rebirth, resurrection, when there was a time where life might come after death. I remember those are pearls that were his eyes. And yet, again, here the irony is that this does not apply to the man. He is a part of a marriage in a part of a wasteland that is ever spiraling downward, losing meaning, losing definition, losing trust along the way, much like Dante, Dante's Inferno, ever spiraling downward. And she says, are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head? And again, hearkening back to section one, this notion of a living death is a real fear. The inability to know, are you alive or not? Are you simply marching asleep? Are you walking dead? Is there nothing in your head at all? Have you lost everything? It says, but oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag. It's so elegant, so intelligent. This is interesting to have this phrase from Shakespeare introduced from the Tempest earlier, and then now you have a, a ragtime jazz song from Eliot's current culture, that Eliot was fascinated by the modern culture he lived in, the jazz age of the 20s, and you have a blending of high and low culture, all of it collapsing on itself, that Shakespeare, as he's referenced here and referenced later in the poem, is being reduced into a lyric from a ragtime song, a Shakespearean rag. It's so elegant and so intelligent. But now we go back to the wife's voice. What shall I do now? What shall I do? Again, the, the prospect of living in a wasteland has massive implications, and one of which is that any task we set our hand to, anything we fill up our days with, ultimately is robbed of its purpose and meaning. If there's, no, if there's no aim and no direction, these are the questions we're left with. What shall I do? What do I do now? I shall rush out as I am and walk the street with my hair down. So, what shall we do tomorrow? 
and then it reaches its ultimate formulation, what shall we ever do? And that brings in this eternal fear. And the fear that eternity is repetitive and dull. What shall we ever do? The same thing we do every day. If there is no purpose, no future for us to put our hand to the ground to create, if there's nothing that can grow from this dry soil, what do we do with these days? What shall we ever do together? And she answers her own question, but it's only with a series of mundane details. The hot water at 10 for tea. And if it rains, a closed car at 4 will go for a drive. And we shall play a game of chess. And their love, their marriage, their marriage is reduced to a game. That is what they shall ever do. They sit down to play their game of chess, to scheme, strategize, outmatch, outdominate. Their communication has broken down. All they have is this game, this conduit between their relationship. The only way they are able to communicate with one another is through this chess game. Interestingly, Elliot, with the help of Ezra Pound, eventually edited it out. But there is a line here in the original version that's interesting to take note of. Where Elliot says, the ivory men make company between us. And though it's not in the final version, I think it's interesting to see in juxtaposing with the lines we've already noticed that all they have is this game of chess and the ivory men make company between them. That the figures of the chessboard become the way that they can commune with one another. That they are ultimately alone, though they are seated together at the same game. The husband and wife are in the same physical location, focused on the same task, the game of chess. But the only company between them, the only real intimacy between them, is in the figures of the chessboard. Cold, marble, lifeless chess pieces. And as they play their game of chess, they press lidless eyes, this wakefulness, this ever-wakefulness, glaring at the game of chess, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. A knock we all know will never come. Whether this is a reference to Christ, behold, I stand at the door and knock, a salvation that will never come, or if it's simply the figure of death knocking on their door, beckoning them into life everlasting, we leave their story with this sense of waiting. That knock, be it salvation or the finality of death, is not going to come. They simply press lidless eyes as they play their game. And the wheel image from the burial of the dead is incorporated back. This is all they ever do. What shall we ever do? Sit to our game of chess and wait for a knock upon the door that is never going to arrive. For the last part of the section, we move to another tale of a marriage. Here it is uh, evidently much different, uh, most notably that this is a lower class couple being described, most likely because of the language Elliot uses uh, we have the common British vernacular of the common everyday townspeople. Um, we'll see that in the language he uses. But this is a description that takes place in a this is a description of a marriage that takes place in a London bar room. Uh, you have two ladies at the bar at night drinking together, speaking of a third lady named Lil and her husband. So already we should note the detachment that is evident in the scenery, that Lil and her husband are not even represented. They are simply being discussed. They cannot speak for themselves. Other voices speak for them. 
But the speaker says, when Lil's husband got demobbed, or demobilized from the army. Again, this is post-war. It's a common event. It says, when Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince my words, I said to her myself, and then we get this interruption, hurry up, please, it's time. There's no punctuation, and it seems to be an interrupting voice of the bartender himself. Hurry up, please, it's time would be a last call that the barkeeper would send out to those who are still in his pub. And the fact that this phrase is repeated throughout the end of the section breaks up the narrative of the story, which we've seen before, that the, the modern wasteland is a, a land of competing voices toppling on top of each other, constantly interrupting, constantly hindering any real narrative or real story from being told. Remember Philomela. She is unable to tell her story. The organ of storytelling itself is removed. It is uh, permanently interrupted and hindered. And so now we have this bartender's voice constantly intruding in on the story, and yet we have to try to make out the story of Lil and her husband. But she says, when Lil's husband got demobbed, I didn't mince my words, I said to her myself, now Albert's coming back? Make yourself a bit smart. Appealing. Look nice. For your husband returning from war. He'll want to know what you've done. There's that lower class phrasing that Elliot uses. He'll want to know what you've done with that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. So again, this is a poor, lower class, poverty-stricken marriage that she does not have the resources to be able to take care of herself properly. Uh, one can only imagine the kind of life she led while her husband is at war. It mentions that she has several children, that this is a struggling wife that's being described diametrically opposed from the rather well-to-do wife of the earlier section. He'll want to know what you've done with the money he gave you to get yourself some tea. He did. I was there. You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set, he said. I swear I can't bear to look at you. Now here's where we get an inside look into the nature of their corroding marriage. That whereas the earlier couple were simply halted in their ability to commune with one another. The intimacy was at a standstill. Uh, they had a stalemate in their game of chess. Here we have this aggressive, belittling, insulting marriage where the husband claims he is unable to bear to look at his wife in her current condition. She is degraded and demoted and verbally abused by Albert. I can't bear to look at you and no more can't I, I said, and think of poor Albert. So she agrees. She says, think of poor Albert. He's been in the army four years. He wants a good time. So here we have the notion of sex within marriage used as a threat. That Lil had better clean herself up, make herself as appealing as possible, because Albert will want his good time, and he is going to get it. And if you don't give it to him, there's others will. That is the reality that is held over Lil's head. If you do not make yourself as attractive and appealing as possible, Albert has every right to seek it elsewhere. And this, again, Elliot is speaking to a product of Darwinian thought, of naturalism, that man and woman operate on sexual instincts and desires and urges. And for Albert to want a good time, it is only natural for him, in his human nature, to seek it in the most convenient place possible. And if Lil is unable to cooperate on those lines, he'll seek it elsewhere. And thus the marriage would be dissolved and corroded. Oh, is there, she said. Something of that, I said. Then I'll know who to thank, she said, and give me a straight look. Hurry up, please. It's time. 
the interrupting voice again, breaking up the narrative. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't. So notice Lil's inability. She is paralyzed. She is unable to do anything about her condition. And we'll see why. What has she done with the money that Albert gave her to fix herself up, to replace her teeth? But if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. You ought to be ashamed. Look at this degrading of the woman. She ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique in her only 31. The fear of aging here again incorporated. Remember the epigraph with the Sybil of Cumai, that she is doomed with a life of eternal living with eternal aging. It is a fear. You ought to be ashamed to look so antique at 31. So this is still a young woman being insulted for looking so antique. I can't help it, she said. So here is her rationalization for why she looks the way she does. Pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off. To bring what off, she said. She's had five already and nearly died of young George. So here we get an... Uh, a reference to the pills she takes and the amount of children she has, that she's had five already, and she almost died in giving birth to the fifth, young George. Which this is the modern era of Eliot's time, that uh, for a woman to get pregnant and to give birth was a frightening experience, that there was a high possibility she would not survive it, especially if she was a lower class poor woman as Lil is. And so she says, I can't help looking so antique. My physical body has taken a toll because of these pills that the chemist gave me. And this perhaps strikes the most dismal, most despairing tone of this section, where Lil claims a promise she was given that did not hold true. She says, the chemist said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. And here's the problem for Lil, that she trusted that the chemist who provided her these pills said it would be alright, but I've never been the same. It looks as though Lil has used the money that Albert has given her for the new teeth on pills to instigate an abortion. Her fear of losing her life yet again in another frightening experience of childbirth, said she nearly died of young George, were she to get pregnant again, she would fear for her life, surely. And so she buys these pills to take care of it through abortion. And her physical appearance has dealt with the aftermath of that. It has taken a toll. Yet she says the chemist promised, he said it would be all right. But I've never been the same. And that's the nature of this ethical decision that Lil has made. That she trusted that going through an abortion to save herself and to save her marriage would be alright. It would have no residual effects. It would have no psychological effects. Everything is going to be okay. But she says, I've never been the same. And she is altered and changed forever as a result. And this is a truth of the modern era that is so penetrating and so insightful, even for us, these decades later, that how often might we believe that everything will be all right when we make unethical, immoral judgments? We believe, we buy the lie that everything will be all right, and we are burdened when reality strikes that we will never be the same. Lil cannot be the same. She is changed forever as a result of this decision. But we also see the predicament of the modern woman as Eliot perceives it. And that is that she must maintain her physical appeal as a wife, right? Remember, Albert can't bear to look at her. But she must also maintain her ability to bear children.
as a mother. And the fear is, what if these two dimensions, these two realities, are incompatible? What if the bearing of children time and time again diminishes or weakens the physical appeal? Or vice versa, if an intense focus and emphasis on the physical appeal means you must do whatever necessary to restrict the ability to bear children. Yet the expectations are the same. The modern woman was placed in this dual identity where she must be the appealing wife as a way of keeping her man from straying, but she must also bear children. She must be fertile. And if those are incompatible realities, the woman is caught in a major conflict. You are a proper fool, proper fool I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What you get married for if you don't want children? Again, the woman viewed as valuable concerning her usefulness. She is a piece of utility. As long as she can bear children, she is valuable. Hurry up, please, it's time. And she describes how they met. Why did you get married if it wasn't for children? And she says, well, that Sunday Albert was home. They had a hot gammon. And they asked me into dinner to get the beauty of it hot. Hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. And it's interesting that her story is interrupted. Yet again, remember Philomela. She is unable to explain the story of their falling in love, the story that everyone wants to hear about a couple. And she is asked, why did you get married? And she goes into the story going into the past, this moment where maybe things did work and maybe things were wonderful before their current state of affairs, yet she cannot complete the story. In the middle of her sentence, the bartender repeats his last call. He is wishing to close up the pub. Notice also the descent into darkness and closing. Everything is spiraling toward an end. The bar is about to close. And we never get the rest of her story. We get a chaotic frenzy of voices drowning Lil's narrative. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night, Tata. Good night, good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night, good night. And that last line has particular meaning for Ophelia in Hamlet when she sings her final song to King Claudius before she dies uh, in her perceived scene of madness, that what if that is the prospect for the woman who cannot maintain the identities that she's expected to maintain? There are only two realities. The first, to become the queen piece on the chessboard, to seek to assume all authority and all power, to seek to dominate the husband, and thus pervert love into a game of strategies and wits. That is one option. The second option is to collapse like Ophelia, to bow out, to approach death on your own.